In early March of 2020, we universally experienced something which was completely foreign to us all. Almost overnight, we shut down our society pretty much in all aspects. And in in a part of that shutdown, literally millions of fitness studios and gyms, dance studios and music conservatories, art classes had to shut their doors And in that moment, all of the instructors that taught those classes, the community instructors that taught different uh, different courses and different classes to our community, they had they were tasked with reinventing themselves and taking this content which their community relied on and converting it into online delivery. And what what a what a time! It was chaotic. It was depressing it was concerning there was so much going on but in all of this chaos all of these instructors dug in and figured out how to maintain some sense of normality at least they tried to for their students some were more successful than others but overall i would say that they did a phenomenal job today on Dottotech, I am interviewing a whole bunch of different community teachers, asking them how they manage this conversion and what lessons they've learned in the hope that we can all learn from the, from the different ways that they put together their systems and converted their own content into online delivery. So how community teachers reacted to converting to online and the tips that they can share with us today on Dottotech. Steve Dotto here. How the heck you doing this fine day? And today on Dotto Tech, as I mentioned in the opening, we are going to be talking to a variety of different community teachers, dance instructors, fitness instructors, music teachers, people who had to reinvent what they do almost overnight and deliver the content that they have been training their entire life to teach in a physical class and learn how to deliver it in this space, in the online space. And I think overall, they did just an amazing job. And they did so, I think, with a lot of grace and good humor. They, they, they really kind of dug in and, uh, and, and embraced the opportunity, embraced it as an opportunity rather than as a task. I think we would all agree with that. And they've learned all sorts of really cool ways because since there was no playbook for them all to follow, they all had to figure out their own way of doing things. And so in this video today, I interview a whole series of them and we I basically ask them how they invented themselves and what they've learned from the lessons. So if you are interested in using online for community instruction, teaching any community sort of classes, today's video is for you because you're gonna get, first of all, the insight on what it was like for them doing the transition but also the tips that they've learned, which you can perhaps glean some nuggets of knowledge from for your own online instruction. It was interesting. I spent hours and hours and hours sitting at my computer reading, you know, as much material as I could on Zoom and other platforms. I hope you were watching good videos on YouTube by Steve Dotto about how to use Zoom. I love all my Steve Dotto videos. We will spend a lot of time in this video talking about what they learned as far as being educators and teachers and dealing with their students. But we are also going to spend considerable time talking about the technology that they ended up using. In the old days, we do Skype lessons. And I was very nervous about the technology because in those days of doing Skype, it was a little hairy carry as to what the connection would be, especially like four or five years ago. You live in a small condo, don't you? I do. I live in an so apartment. So where, how did you set up? So take me through your setup. So I have a piece of uh, floor, uh, tap floor on the board. And no, tap board on the floor. And then uh, I have a uh, tripod set up where I uh, sort of invited my own camera into my Zoom class. So I have my cell phone that's set up with uh, the tripod. And then I have my computer that I do my oh. music and actually chatting with the kids during class. So you really, you have very little additional gear. What are you doing for audio? Audio is just my AirPods. Okay. Oh, wow. So you really had to buy nothing. You you had to buy a tripod. Did you buy some extra lighting? I bought it. I had a tripod already. I bought a ring light and I bought a wireless, uh, a wireless um, uh, remote for my phone so that I could start and stop. 
So yeah. your setup now is you've got this computer here, which we're talking to you on now, which you use for administration. Yeah. So you have all the kids registered there. You can see them in gallery view, all that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. You've got your phone set up close to you on a tripod. And yeah. you use it, and using the camera and the microphone on the phone, or I guess you're not using the mic, but the camera on the phone, it's a pretty good camera. It's probably a better yeah. camera. Yeah, it is. It's better quality. The kids can see me better. So, and then, no, just and you're teaching tap because you teach other mm -hmm. classes. But I got I gotta ask you, do, does yeah. anybody live beneath you? I have people that live all around me. So oh, no. when I knew this was gonna happen, I wrote them all a really nice note, and I I laid out my schedule actually like to the hour. I teach. On you know Tuesdays from five to seven is all tap dancing, and so I apologize in advance. And if anything gets too much, send me a text, and you know we'll figure that out. And I bought everybody that uh, sort of lives below me and beside me. I bought them all earplugs and a bottle of wine to say I'm sorry and I'm, and thank you. So, but <laughs> thankfully, thankfully they're oh, all very hell. understanding. On one side of my neighborhood, my next door neighbor is an oboe player teacher. On the other side, it's a tap dancer. <laughs> All of the instructors that I talked to for synchronous lessons preferred using Zoom by and large. Uh, they had a variety of different setups, usually just a basic Zoom setup, sort of what I have right now, a webcam with a decent microphone. Uh, although what we saw from Nicole was, I think, a really creative use of some existing technology that she had using her smartphone as a second camera, bringing it in as a participant in the Zoom call, and then having it focused on a small area on her feet uh, in her particular case. And for if you're a community teacher teaching art or some other topic, that's a great option rather than doing screen sharing and having to kind of work out uh, switching back and forth with cameras from your main feed, but having a second feed using that smartphone camera, which we know is an excellent camera. So I think that that was a very cool option for Nicole to look at. Uh, but by and large, almost all of them or all of them did prefer using Zoom for synchronous. But what surprised me is how often they taught asynchronously. They would use other tools, uh, chat-based tools, to teach asynchronously rather than a synchronous class. Yeah, so I found asynchronous teaching a lot easier. So um, I filmed exercises that they did, and also I found exercises to post. Um, we were using Marco Polo, which mm -hmm. I really liked in terms of it being efficient and fast and I could grade anywhere so I could give them feedback. I really liked that I could also give them either text feedback or video feedback. So I could like, there's a little bubble that pops up and I could be like, okay, so. So what Kerry was talking about there, Marco Polo, it's actually a messaging app that you can use on your smartphone that's sort of like Snapchat, but the conversations last longer. I think the videos are left up for a month on Marco Polo, but it's like a text messaging app. You go back and forth, but you're recording video clips to have the communication go back and forth, which I thought was genius. So I do a lot of like film yourself, watch yourself, fix it, film yourself again, and then send it to me. And these kids were re recording, then re-recording, and then re-recording and going, oh no, I still can't play that part, and re-recording. There was a lot more attention to detail because, you know what, they had to listen back to themselves and go, oh, I thought I played that well, but I didn't. One fact that started to come clear to me is teaching this way, teaching skills like music or dance, uh, there's not an equivalency as far as the amount of time that it takes for the teacher. Because they aren't in a classroom environment, uh, they have to go over the same content maybe multiple times with multiple different students. So time is not equitable. It takes them longer to convey the same information to a group of students as it would individually. But overall, there's a kind of a balance to that is the level of instruction, the level of detail in most cases sounds to me like it was superior. The online is a, it's just another tool in the toolbox. I don't think I don't think it's a compromise. I think at first that's a discussion has come up when I've discussed this with other community music schools. Is like some people feel that this is they should be paying less or something. And it's like this has been a, a question. Is it is it it's actually more work for us? Yeah. On the teacher side, because there's a way more prep that has to happen, and etc. But the thing is, at the end of the day, because of all that extra. 
I feel that it's, it's, we're providing a better service. The term, and a lot of them said, it was great to be able to have that time to take it away without that sense of peer pressure, without that sense of like needing to keep up and to watch it as many times as I need it. Yeah. You know, so that was really cool to hear. Now, obviously, there are some serious limitations as well. There are just some things that we do when we're teaching face-to-face -face that we can't replicate in the online space. The thing they miss from me is I'm also a pianist, so I spend a lot of time accompanying students and playing with yeah. the students. So I've had to do a lot of work ahead of time to create, you know, tracks. Because like, like my students can't do, you know, I have some kids who can't do a full kick in their room because they're only in their room and they have a desk and a bed and chair. And, and so having limited space myself and having to restrict what I do uh, makes it easier for them because then I know, well, if I can't do that, then they definitely can't do that. Lots of trial and error because when you're teaching online, not only are you in a different environment where you're doing the instruction from, but your students are in a different environment. Sometimes they're in their bedroom, as Nicole was just saying there, where she's teaching dance, and maybe her students don't have to, the room to do a whole bunch of the moves that you would be able to in a studio. But other times you have family members or parents looking over your shoulder and judging everything you do every step of the way. So recognizing the environment, not just for the instructor, but the environment for the students, that was a big learning process that all of our teachers went through. Now, the fitness instructors and the trainers that I talked to had an entirely different challenge in the early days than did the dance instructors and the music teachers and the martial arts instructors that I chatted with. And that was that the fitness classes that were being replaced, they were trying to replace the, uh, the, the social environment and the energy that came from being in a room of people working out. Because the goals and objectives, of course, of fitness are to have a good hard workout as opposed to develop a skill. So they faced a whole different series of challenges as they entered the transition. The, the first few, few days were, were chaos um, because because you're not just trying to figure out, well, what do I do with my business? It's like, and how do I homeschool my children? And you know, all of the other factors as well. But so on the Tuesday, I shut down all of my classes and told my community that was it, we're, we're done. And then by the Wednesday I was live streaming. So I was very lucky. I have a space here that I train PT clients from anyway. So I set up the webcam on a little mini tripod and popped my laptop on the side. And I had a tiny little Bluetooth speaker that I put underneath the webcam because I've got the Logitech C920, which is a, a great mm -hmm. webcam. And I literally ran my classes like that for a few weeks. But an interesting fact occurred. Every single fitness instructor who I spoke with said the same thing, that they had either already started and dabbled with or were planning to transition part of their business to online prior to the outbreak of COVID-19. In other words, they recognized that their industry was already moving to online delivery as part, if not all, of the delivery services of the service that they were going to be delivering to their clientele. A year ago, I think in March of last year, I decided that I wanted to try to start a, a virtual component to my business and offer online, uh, live online classes to people who are stuck at home, yeah. like uh, moms with small children or people who worked from home. Yeah. And it didn't really take off because I, I couldn't figure out how to find that market. Well, <laughs> now, now the mar that market is everyone in the world. The common theme that I heard from every one of the instructors when I talked to them about the future of their online business is they all were excited about the breaking down of barriers. The local barriers where previously they would only have local students in their dance school, in their music school, in their fitness class. But now they've discovered that they can indeed reach the entire world. And there's now starting to come up with different techniques as far as marketing. Some of them they're coming up with themselves and some of them their communities coming up with for them. While I'm getting my shoes on, they all talk to each other about their day and how they've been getting on. And then at the end of the class, we talk to each other again on Zoom. And then what they all do is they take screenshots and selfies. They're so good at this. Um, I don't even know when they're taking them. And then they will 
pop that onto social media and tag oh. their friends and tag me and uh, this we're, we're a community we're a family and they'll just be like these classes are amazing and my students have been pulling people in to come and join oh, my classes great? so it's pretty exciting i think that you are now you know you've been doing this for however long you've been doing it and you've been reaching this community and they've been loving you and now you just get to do that to a wider audience so since I've been on group, I've, I think, I'm sorry, on group, I'm Zoom, I've, uh, I've almost doubled my group and I've added a second class. Without doubt, the fitness community has benefited from the fact that fitness instructors can niche down and concentrate on a specific demographic as opposed to concentrating on a specific geography. That's ended up being a real benefit to the ones that have figured it out. Now, I want to spend, before we wrap things up, uh, in my conversations, I came across a few gems that don't necessarily fit everywhere else, one of which was shared by Nicole about the use of Zoom rooms. Oh, the breakout rooms. Uh, I use them often. Uh, I often will break the, the students up into smaller groups and give them either uh, an activity or I'll say, you know, let's, let's go over scene two. And so in your groups, here's five questions, and I want you to discuss those five questions about the, about the scene, and then we come back together and we discuss. And so I will float through all the rooms to answer questions or to chat um, with smaller groups, and then, uh, and then, yeah, we bring them back together. Specifically, Nicole was talking about theater games for her musical theater class, uh, but the fact that the kids can break into small scene groups, work on individual uh, scenes or, or exercises, theater sports type exercises, and then come back uh, into, to, the, to the overall group, I think is a nice creative use of those breakout rooms. Without fail, every instructor who I talked to said the same thing. They believed that this experience has made them better instructors, better teachers. They all felt they did a good job before, but because of the nature of going into a class and teaching or into a studio and teaching, uh, they could coast a little bit. They could rely on their experience as opposed to their preparation for that particular class because often they're pre-recording things and just the amount of control that's required to deliver effectively into this environment, they all felt that they will come away from this experience as a better instructor than they were before. Um, and so I am finding at the end of those days, I just, I have a glass of wine and I go to bed because I'm so tired. Good God. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So, yeah, I'm finding the Zoom fatigue is, is, uh, is very, very real. Um, I am expending a lot more energy just talking at my computer. And also, I'm not getting that that uh, two-way uh, interaction as much. And so I'm finding, like, I'm having to put on a lot more of a show while I'm teaching. I think it's a really tough time for everybody, a very unsettling time for, for, for everybody, kids, teachers, doesn't matter. And it's been, uh, I think music has been a nice thing and a great thing for them because through all this chaos or not knowing, that there's been this sort of consistent thing that, you know, I still have my lessons, I still have my music, I still have my art. And I think that those kind of things are, I don't know, my belief that those, those sort of things are what keep us going as a species. <laughs> we are, what, 18 minutes or so into this video. And uh, this is the result of about six and a half hours of interviews with these instructors and with other instructors. Now, if you'd be so kind, in the description, we have links to each one of the instructors uh, who shared with us, those that were in the video, as well as several others, Whose, whose comments did not make it into the video, I encourage you to drop by, visit them, take a look at what they have to say, and, and thank them if you get the opportunity for the effort that they put in. And I personally want to thank everybody who contributed so much time to helping me understand a lot better about what the community teachers have gone through and the different tips and techniques that you've learned in this process. I recognize how important these people have been to the health of our community as we've moved ahead. It, keeping a little bit of normal life for students, for kids that are in dance or music, those of us that rely on exercise in order for, to have mental as well as physical health, and the fact that they had to reinvent themselves, learn skills that they were that they never enrolled for. They didn't, you know, somebody that teaches clarinet didn't sign up in order to learn how to deliver their lessons over Zoom. That wasn't in the, in the in the program when they started. But without fail, it seems to me that they've stepped up to the challenge and they've helped us weather this storm. So on behalf of me, and I'm sure on behalf of you, 
a big heartfelt thanks to one and all. And you can tell them that in the comments as well. Let me know if you what you've learned from this or if there are other suggestions and ideas that you know about in order to more effectively deliver content and educational content through distance and through video conferencing tools, etc. Love to see your comments and I read each and every one even if I don't have time to comment back on every comment that is posted. Now, if you found this video to be useful, a couple of favors to ask. First and foremost is please give us a thumbs up. That would help tremendously in getting the message out about this video. And secondly, if you've not subscribed to this channel, what the heck are you waiting for? Click that subscribe button, ring that notification bell, and I will see you next time for more Dotto Tech. Until then, I'm Steve Dotto. Have fun storming a castle.